Our speaker for today is Alyssa, and she is an archivist and the records uh, management specialist at the Oklahoma Department of Libraries. So we're, we're glad to have her here today, and I'm going to hand it over to her. Thanks, Kate. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Alyssa Vaughn, and I'm an archivist at the Oklahoma State Archives. And I want to thank Allen County Public Library for inviting me um, to give this presentation to all. I'm excited to share with you about the records that we have in our collections that might help you with your family history research, or I hope at least get you maybe a little more interested in Oklahoma history. So the Oklahoma State Archives is a part of the Oklahoma Department of Libraries in Oklahoma City. ODL was established in 1890 to be a research library for members of the state legislature. And today the agency is responsible for public library development, statewide literacy projects, and records management for state government. But ODL also has several special collections, including the state archives, which are open for public research. The State Archives houses 26,000 cubic feet of permanent state government records, such as governor's papers, Supreme Court cases, legislation, and state agency publications. So prior to becoming a state in 1907, Oklahoma was split into Oklahoma Territory and Indian Territory, and each of those had their own governments that were established in 1890. Our collections then, for the most part, begin in 1890 and then end in the 1980s. Unfortunately, since 1989, our building, building has been at physical capacity, meaning we can't bring in any more, more current records into our space. And so most of the records created since 1989 are still with the, either the state agencies that created them or in one of our two off-site warehouse locations. However, our um, state legislator just last year appropriated money to help us address this problem. So we're excited to be in the planning process of a building renovation that will hopefully allow us to bring state government records from the last 30 years under one roof. And the renovation will be a huge multi-year project, we know, but it's going to be so worth it to be able to preserve more of our state's government records and to make them accessible to researchers. So before I get too far in my presentation, I think it's worth mentioning some of the records that we don't have in the state archives, especially since these are some records that are most sought after by genealogists. So every state archives is different, and we likely don't have the same records that you might find in your own state's archives. So we don't have birth or death certificates, marriage licenses or divorce decrees, adoption records, Native American ancestry records, citizenship records, or school transcripts or diplomas. But there are links for the correct institutions to contact on the screen. And I just wanted to share this information up front to hopefully help streamline your research and maybe answer some of the questions that you might be putting into chat. So digitized content from our collections is available on our website that's called Digital Prairie. The website has 19 different collections from several different divisions at the Department of Libraries, and eight of those collections are from the state archives. So our primary collection is called archives.ok.gov, which you can see here at the top, and it includes state agency annual reports, newsletters, directories, correspondence, and other state government records. And the link to Digital Prairie is the last bullet point on this slide. And also each of the photos over here on the right are links to that collection. And so you'll receive a copy of these slides that includes these links. So you don't need to worry about opening them all right now, but I wanted you to have those links for easy access later on. So Digital Prairie also provides access to some of our finding aids or inventories of the records in the state archives along with some fun content like an Oklahoma history timeline and some digital puzzles, which are under the extras tab up here on the right. Even if you don't have any family connections to Oklahoma, you may enjoy learning more about Oklahoma's history through some of the resources you can find on Digital Prairie. The archives.ok.gov collection on Digital Prairie is where you're going to find the majority of the records that we've digitized from the state archives. 
There are over 3,800 items currently in the collection with many more being prepared to upload. So I encourage you to check back frequently for new additions. And there are filters on the left side of the screen to browse by the creating agency, publication type, date, or subject. Or you can use the search bar up here in the top right to search for someone's name or an agency or a year. So there are transcripts uploaded with each item so that when you use that search bar, the system is searching the metadata that our archivists have created, as well as the full text of each of the documents. And if you do find a useful record on here, you can print it or download it and save it for later. When researching your family's history in the state archives, it's really helpful to think about how your family member might have interacted with state government. Were they a state employee or an elected official? Did they receive a license or pension from the state? Did they benefit from any of the services that state agencies provide? State agency publications can have a wealth of information about some of these government programs and services, many of which did have direct impacts on Oklahoma citizens. So the agency reports and newsletters often include very personal stories of services that were provided, such as workforce training for the disabled or health screenings at schools, like the newsletter you see on the screen here. The collection also includes publications that were created by residents of state schools and hospitals and by inmates of state institutions. So you can find records online from the Oklahoma State Penitentiary and State Reformatory, Taft State Hospital, Western State Hospital, and the Western Oklahoma Tuberculosis Sanatorium. And we do have records from other institutions that are not online, so just contact us to inquire about those. So these publications include information on the programs and activities at these institutions, and sometimes will include resident names and photographs. And even if you don't find the name of your family member in one of these publications, they're still useful for understanding the administration, the conditions, and the programs at these institutions when your family member might have been there. Another state agency publication on our website is the Educational Directory, which was published annually by the Oklahoma State Department of Education. The directory lists all public schools and independent school districts that employed four or more teachers that school year. The directories include the names of the high school principals, district superintendents, and administrators of state institutions, and they also have the number of teachers and students at each school. So you can see from the example on the screen that there were seven school districts in McLean County in 1932 and that had at least four teachers, and the largest school district had 23 teachers that year. The directories online are from 1909 to 1978, and the link to access them is right here. One of the largest collections on Digital Prairie is the Confederate Pension Records. So in 1915, Oklahoma passed legislation to provide pensions to disabled and impoverished Confederate soldiers, sailors, and their widows that lived in Oklahoma. These veterans didn't serve in Oklahoma because Oklahoma wasn't a state during the Civil War. They only had to be living in Oklahoma when they applied for the pension. So, and some other states also provided pensions to Confederate veterans because the federal government only provided pensions for Union soldiers. So the records include information about the veterans' current residence, their birthplace, military service, physical condition, and financial status. This particular pension on the screen is for Fanny Long Murphy Bailey. She lived in the Confederate home in Ardmore and actually became the widow of three different Confederate veterans, all of whom she probably met while living in the veteran's home. So it sounds like she was a professional wife. But the record shows that one of her husbands, Henry Long, served in Mississippi's infantry for four years and was honorably discharged in 1865. There are over 7,600 pension records on Digital Prairie, but the collection is not quite complete. So if you don't find a record with a simple name search using the search box up here, I recommend consulting the index, which you can find right here, and looking to see if there are other 
records that we have on the index that aren't yet online. If you find a family member or someone you'd like to see their record, just send us an email and we'd be happy to provide you with copies of that file. Another popular collection we have on Digital Prairie is called Images of Oklahoma. So through a long time grant project funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services, we have digitized yearbooks from small public libraries, archives, and museums across Oklahoma that don't have the equipment or the web services to be able to make them accessible online. So there are over 800 yearbooks from 40 different institutions on Digital Prairie, and the yearbooks span 1903 to 1997. Most of the yearbooks are from high schools, but you can also find some from several different colleges and universities, such as Langston University or Oklahoma Christian University. So we're gonna switch gears now and talk about some of the other records available in the state archives that are not online. As I'm sure you're all aware, many different professions require licenses from state governments to operate within that state. And so we have licensing files from six different professions, attorneys, barbers, dentists, medical and osteopathic doctors, and pharmacists. And these are all great sources of information for family history research. And we'll look at some examples of these records on the next few slides. So those seeking to become licensed attorneys in Oklahoma submit applications to the Oklahoma Bar Association. And we have those applications from 1907 to 1950. The applications include information about the applicant's current residence, birthplace, education, and experience. And they often include letters of recommendation describing the applicant's character or previous experience. In the middle of the screen is a certificate showing a J.C. Bohart was admitted to practice law in Indian Territory in 1902. He submitted this certificate as proof of his previous experience with his application in 1907 to be licensed in the new state of Oklahoma. And on the right side is a standard application form from 1907. It shows that the applicant had lived in Oklahoma for three and a half years at the time that he applied, but he had previously lived in Indianapolis and attended law school in Tennessee. Another application file we have is for doctors of osteopathy. So the State Board of Medical Examiners, which you'll see at the top of the form right here, may make you think of doctors who perform autopsies, but it was the original name for the agency that licensed doctors in Oklahoma. And today, doctors of medicine and doctors of osteopathy are licensed by two different agencies. We received these osteopathy applications from the agency just last year, and the records cover 1903 to 1921. The files will typically include information about the applicant's address, birth and date location, education, and letters of recommendation. For example, William Harrison Holcroft on the screen here was born in Indiana in 1883, attended high school in Ohio, and graduated from a college in Missouri in 1909. And when I was putting this presentation together, I was surprised at how much people used to move around. And even if you aren't aware of any Oklahoma connections in your family history, it may be worth checking out our collections because perhaps they only lived here a short time before they moved somewhere else. Most of the applications um, in these files include notarized photographs, and our staff really enjoyed looking at all these when we process and digitize the records. Here are some of our favorite photographs that we found in the collection. And maybe one of the reasons that we love the photographs so much is that our collections are primarily paper documents. We do have some photographs, maps, and audiovisual records, but by and large, our records here in the State Archives are text documents. So we were very excited to get these new photographs. So like the other application files that we've already discussed, applications to become a licensed pharmacist in Oklahoma include the applicant's address, birth date and location, education and experience, as well as a photograph with the physical description, which may include the height, weight, and eye color. The application on the screen shows James Madden was born in Arkansas, attended school in Louisiana, 
and then at the age of 21, applied for a license in Oklahoma in 1939. And we have pharmacist application files starting in 1899 and up through 1970. So similar to the licensing files, court cases are another large collection of undigitized records that we have in the state archives. We have three different types of court records from the Oklahoma Supreme Court, the Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals, and the U.S. Northern District Court in Benita Indian Territory. And we'll discuss these on the next few slides. So beginning in 1890, Oklahoma Territory and Indian Territory each had their own governments, and thus they had their own Supreme Courts. And we have the case files from both of those courts covering 1890 to 1907, and then we have the case files from the Oklahoma Supreme Court from 1907 until the mid-1980s. And any cases created after the mid-1980s are still with the Supreme Court clerk's office. So the Supreme Court hears civil cases that were appealed from the district court, which may include any number of financial, business, domestic, or property-related disputes. Our cases are organized by case number, and we do not have a name index. However, the Supreme Court's website, called the Oklahoma State Courts Network, has most of the court's opinions, or the final verdict, in a searchable format online. So if you find an opinion online and want to see the rest of the case file, we can use that case number on OSCN to find the physical file here, and we can provide you with digital copies of the case. And the link to OSCN is right here. Criminal cases that are appealed from the district courts in Oklahoma are heard by the Court of Criminal Appeals, which is a part of the state Supreme Court. We have over 2,000 cubic feet of case files covering 1907 to 1979. And like the civil cases we just discussed, the final opinions for these cases can be found on the Oklahoma State Courts Network. An example of one of the criminal cases we have is Kelsey Morrison versus the state of Oklahoma, which may sound familiar if you've read or seen Killers of the Flower Moon about the Osage murders of the 1920s. Kelsey Morrison was paid by William K. Hale to kill Anna Brown in 1923. He was sentenced to murder by the district court, but he appealed to the Court of Criminal Appeals, which is why we have this case file. The case includes the full trial transcript from that district court trial, which includes hundreds of pages of direct and cross-examinations of Kelsey Morrison and quite a few other witnesses. And this transcript was actually shared with the film writers. And if you pay attention to the trial scenes in the movie, you may hear some of the exact wording from these pages. The full case is available on Digital Prairie as well as the other primary source documents from the Osage murders. And the title on the screen is the link to those documents. The court files from the U.S. Northern District Court in Venita Indian Territory are a rare example of federal records that are in the state archives. So these are civil cases that were appealed from the county courthouses in Indian Territory to the district court between 1895 and 1907. The cases primarily involve disputes over land, property, or debts, but they also include some marriage licenses, articles of incorporation, and notary public and power of attorney appointments. The finding aid is available on our website, and this is the link right here. The document on the slide is a census from the city of Venita from 1903. The city was petitioning to become a city of the second class and submitted this census document to show that there were more than 2,000 citizens in Venita at that time. And here are some examples of the other types of records from the U.S. Northern District Court cases. So there is a marriage license from 1898. Articles of Incorporation for the Keystone Oil Company in Bartlesville, and a notary bond for a George W. Moore from 1903. So we have a few other types of family history records to discuss before we open it up for your questions. So one of our popular, 
popular collections here are cattle brand registers. So the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture used to keep handwritten ledgers of cattle brands for each county. The ledgers cover the 1910s to 1950 and vary in format and in the information included. The example in the middle of the screen includes the name of the owner, location of the cattle range, and the date the brand was adopted, along with the description and drawing of the brand. Some of the later ledgers included a visual representation of the brand on the cattle, which you can see in the upper right corner of the screen. In 1950, the Department of Agriculture began collaborating with the Oklahoma Cattlemen's Association to publish directories of registered brands every five years. So they issued supplements in between those five years for any new brands that got registered. There are 44 issues covering 1950 to 1990 with some gaps that have been digitized and are available on our website. And the title on the screen is a link to those documents. So you can see from the image on the right that these books contain slightly different information than the older ledgers did. They typically only have the registrant's name and address and a drawing of the brand. So an interesting story about the cattle brands is one time we helped a researcher find brands for two of her family members. She owned a cabin that her and her extended family would use for vacations, and she was decorating each bedroom in the cabin um, to be themed around one of their ancestors. So she got custom headboards made with these cattle brands on it for each of the two men that she found their brands. And I thought that was a really unique way to use the information that she found in our collections. The Commissioners of the Land Office is a state agency that, among other things, manages land and resources owned by the state. And you might be familiar with how the federal government surveyed and divided land in new states and territories into townships and ranges. And so in Oklahoma in 1890, section 16 and 36 in every township were set aside for school land. And if any of those sections or parts of those sections didn't end up being used for schools, the commissioners of the land office leased out those tracts to homesteaders. The homesteaders were required to make improvements on the land to be able to continue leasing it, and the commissioners regularly sent out appraisers to assess their improvements. So on the slide is a 1908 appraisal record from Caddo County that describes the topography of the land, where the nearest railroads and towns were, how many people lived on the land, and what kinds of trees, crops, livestock, and buildings had been added to the land to improve it. And we have appraisal books from 1897 to 1910. So here's another researcher story. Um, one time we had someone looking for her great grandfather who she knew had leased school land, but didn't know where it was. And so using some of the other land office ledgers that we have, we were able to find the legal description of the land and then the appraisal record, which is actually the one on the screen here. So she was so excited to read about how big her great-grandfather's house and barn were, how many peach trees he had, and that he was growing corn, wheat, and alfalfa at that time. She was so excited, in fact, that she drove to where the land is today and actually found an old house still standing that matched a picture she had with her great-grandfather standing in front of it. And that was such a cool story for us. Um, it's so rewarding to be able to share the records that we have carefully collected and preserved with the people who find value in them. The Grand River Dam Authority is another state agency and it manages rivers and lakes in Northeastern Oklahoma and provides public electricity through a hydroelectric dam. Beginning in 1937, the agency relocated at least 20 cemeteries to build the Pensacola Dam and create the Grand Lake of the Cherokees. These cemetery records include information on each gravesite and permission from next of kin to relocate the graves. For example, the 1939 grave removal permit on the left of the screen is permission from Bessie Sweetwater to relocate the grave of her grandparent who died in 1883. The removal order on the right 
of the screen describes the original and reburial grave locations and includes the name of the deceased, cause of death, date of death, nearest relative's name and address, and type of burial container. Since these cemeteries were in the Cherokee Nation, many of the records are for tribal members. And the last type of record I wanna share with you today are our aerial photographs. So we have two sets of aerial photographs that may be useful in seeing what a particular part of the state used to look like. The first set was created by the U.S. Department of Agriculture between 1937 and 1943 and covers the entire state. The second set was completed by the Oklahoma Highway Department in the early 1950s, and they only photographed areas of the state that had highways. The photographs are organized by county, township, and range, so it's necessary to know the legal description of the land that you're looking for. Most of the photographs are available online through the Oklahoma Historical Aerial Digitization Projects website, and this is the link on the screen, but we're happy to help you find a legal description, navigate their website, or we can provide you with higher resolution scans than what you can find online. And as you can see from the photo on the slide, it can be quite tricky to find a particular building or landmark unless it's quite large. We can scan the photographs at very high resolution and you can zoom in on the computer, but you likely will still not be able to find an individual house. This photograph is of downtown Oklahoma City in 1941. It includes the state capitol right up here and it actually took two archivists quite a while to identify this photo as the one with the state capitol in it, and then to locate the capitol within the photo. This is a close-up of the state capitol from that photo. The capitol is 452,000 square feet, so you can imagine how difficult, or maybe even impossible, it can be to find something much smaller. However, the aerial photographs are useful to see the size of the towns back then or how a river or forest area has changed over time. And we even helped a researcher one time find a waterfall that used to be near his family land but no longer exists today. So there are still many uses for these photographs, even if you can't find the family farm. That is the end of my presentation and I'm happy to answer your questions. This person's asking um, about a family history and a rumor in the family that it was donated to a library in Oklahoma. Um, doesn't have a book title and not sure which library it might be in. So um, they haven't had success with searching in WorldCat and just wondering if you have any suggestions on um, maybe how to track that down. I think probably what would be the easiest solution is if you could put all of that in an email to me and we would be happy to help you look into that. Um, sometimes tracking family land can be quite challenging, but we are always up for the challenge. Somebody's wondering about African American records and um, what you what you have in your collection. So we don't, as far as I know, we don't have very much specifically as far as if you were trying to um, trace genealogy or anything that would be separate from the things that I've already um, talked to you about. There were applications for Confederate pension records um, submitted by African Americans, but at that time, Oklahoma would not give them pension records. So we can provide you with the application files, but just know that they wouldn't have actually received a pension from Oklahoma. So somebody's wondering about um, if you have other records that predate statehood. They say that their ancestors moved to Ada in 1890 and founded the town with four other families. Um, so just wondering about finding records for that area. So 1890 is basically about when most of our records start. We're not going to be able to find much from before that, um, but we could possibly find information about the founding of that town. We do have some like articles of incorporation for towns, um, or we could point you maybe to other resources like such as at the Oklahoma Historical Society that may help with your research. Someone else is wondering about where they can find Indian Territory records prior to 1890. It depends on what the record is. So if it might have been 
related with the federal government, like some of the court cases or, you know, something related to arrests at that time, I would check with the National Archives on that. But if it's other types of records, you may want to check with the tribes, their governments that still exist in eastern Oklahoma, maybe great resources for resources for that. The Gateway to Oklahoma History, it, it's through a different agency than ours, but that is a great resource for finding newspaper articles. Someone's asking about the accessibility of your records in person and about um, the hours of the archives. Yeah, great question. So we are open Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, and you don't have to make an appointment. You're welcome to come in anytime, and we'll always have an archivist available to help you find records. Um, or you can submit emails, um, use a form on our website, or call us, and we'd be happy to work with you remotely also. Barbara asks, uh, when did Oklahoma begin keeping birth and death records? It wasn't actually required until 1917, 10 years after we became a state. That's when the State Department of Health finally had a system for keeping those records. So anything prior to that is not guaranteed that it still, still exists. But 1917, that's a good starting point going forward for birth and death records. Someone says, my great-grandfather was born in 1910 and raised in Pittsburgh County, Oklahoma, and have seen school records. Um, and just wondering about um, how could he find records of the school and possible yearbooks. The, the school name was not listed on the document. Okay, so those educational directories I mentioned might be a good place to check to narrow down in that county what schools existed. However, if it was a really small school, less than four teachers, it wouldn't have been included in those directories. Um, but I would encourage you to send us an email and we'll see if we can find anything in our State Department of Education records or we may be able to refer you to someone else. Where is the best place to learn about residents of Whitaker's Orphan Home and School? That was a state institution um, managed by the Department of Human Services. So we have some um, like administrative records about that institution. We don't have anything about the residents there. Um, so you can either contact us for that information or talk to the Oklahoma Department of Human Services. If anybody has any questions following the program, or if you would like a copy of the um, handout or the chat from today's Zoom, please send us an email at genealogy at acpl.info. Thank you again, Alyssa. We really appreciate it. And thank you everyone for attending.